start with number 15. Um, you know we want to solve for the variable a, and isolate it. So, and we know we can do anything as long as we do the same thing on both sides, because it's a, it's a balanced system right now. We want to maintain that balance. So, what would be something we could do, and it turns out to be helpful? F5 both sides, okay? So, go to the next step this way, typically. We don't go horizontally, this is how it's set up. So we'll add 5 to both sides. Negative 5 plus 5 is 0. So on the right, that leaves 1 third a by itself. That's good. And it's 6 over there. So we know that a divided by 3 is, uh, is 6. So how do we find out what a is? Okay, you can divide each side by one third. Um, if we divide by one third, that's the same as doing what? Multiply by three. Multiply by three, yeah, either way. So you multiply, divide this by one third, sure. Multiply this by three, it's all the same. They're equivalent things. So A is 18. Uh, <coughs> Now we have uh, variables on both sides, so what can we do? Any first step? We'll probably do. Okay, you got a negative two in here. If you add a two n to negative two n, you'll get zero. So that means there'll be no variables here. All the variables have been removed from that side. So that's 6n minus 7 is equal to 5. We're going to isolate that variable. Yes? Add 7. So negative 7 plus 7 is 0. 5 plus 7. Uh, 6n equals 12. So we know 6 times the number we want is 12, so the number we want sixth of that divided by six and n is two. So are we having trouble with that or are we just shy today? Raise your hand if you're just shy today. Uh, are are there any questions about a problem like this? Um, it seems like half of them are shy, which I'm just going to assume the half, other half wasn't shy. Um, you want to have the variables on one side, so we'll remove the variables from one of the sides, and so that's what we're really doing here. We have a negative 2n, and we're going to get rid of that negative 2n, and to balance it, we'll put 2n on this side so that it's all balanced. Uh, and from there, that's a, an equation that I saw most of you work out just fine the last time we were together. Okay. So we could work out an equation that has variables on both sides. This is variables on both sides, but what do we need to do before we can really do anything? Right, distribute. Be careful that you don't do something like subtract n, okay? Because think about this. This is inside of parentheses, and what's happening to the, this parentheses? What's happening to it? It's getting multiplied by a negative four. Right? So if I just subtract n from this side, well, it's not actually n, it's actually worth negative four times n, so you can't just subtract that outside of the parentheses. Just subtract it from in the, within there. Distribute first, and we'll get negative 4n minus 8. Distribute on this, the other side, 3n minus 12. Very similar to the problem we just did. Variables on both sides, so what can we do? What did you do? Add 4n to, to both sides. 
negative 8 equals 7n minus 12. Okay, what now? And then, last, divide by seven. Okay. No need for a calculator. Four sevens <coughs> completely uh, obtainable. We don't need to write decimal. Okay. Um, over here, we have variables on both sides, and we have fractions. With the fractions. Didn't, they don't change anything. Right? Fractions can be combined together just like any other numbers. It takes a little more work. But if we're going to here or here, right, when we have variables on both sides, uh, you know, we take them away from one side, right, we eliminate them on this side, and then we do the equivalent operation on this side, we do the same thing here. Okay. So what should we do then? Multiply the fraction to get a common denominator. Okay, that's assuming we're going to put some fractions together, right? Yeah. And when, so let's let's put ourselves in a situation where we're combining fractions. Like, what fractions are we going to add or subtract? Um, um, like, we can get a common denominator through through all these fractions. Um, that won't necessarily be what you have to do every problem. So what I'm saying right now is we're not trying to combine any fractions, so we don't have any need to, to get a common denominator. So, because I can't add this fraction to that fraction. They're not like terms. Right, that's all I was saying. So now, if we do that, absolutely, we need to find a common denominator. What's the common denominator going to be? 63. Now multiply this one by 9 over 9, and this one by 7 over 7. And we're going to get 27 over 63 w minus uh, 28 over 63 w equals, or actually minus 2 ninths. We've got the 27 over 63 minus the 28 over 63 minus 2 ninths equals 1 seventh. What would you do next? Combine like terms. Okay, combine like terms. So 27 60 thirds minus 28 60 thirds is 1 60 thirds, no, negative 1 60 thirds. Negative 1 63rd w minus 2 ninths is equal to 1 seventh. So what next? Negative 163w equals, oh, I need to get a common denominator, right? Mm -hmm. The common denominator is going to be? 63. 63, again. How many 63rds will this be? Nine. Nine 63rds. Multiply by nine over nine. Nine over nine. We'll get nine 63rds. And how about this one? 14. 14 and multiply we'll by seven over seven. So plus 14 60 thirds. Negative 1 60 third W equals 23 over 63. Very near the 
end. We have negative one, six, 1 over 63 times w, so how do we, what's the inverse of that? by a negative 63. Okay. 63 over 1. We'll cancel that factor. Negative times negative is positive, so we do have a positive w over here. Multiply this by a negative 63 over 1. Cancels. We get a negative 23. Okay. Um, collecting the quizzes, um, I saw some answers. I saw a number 47 with negative 23 written right after the problem was written down. Um, I'm going to be really suspicious of that, of just an answer written after the question. No work shown. You think it's a reasonable suspicion? Okay. Uh, if you go about it this way and you do the work, it's going to take a few steps to find the answer is negative 23. Um, the other option is guessing. You could guess the answer, guess the solution, right? Okay. Is that possible? Could you guess it? Could you just, you know, just keep guessing? No, that's not quite. That's not quite right. That's not quite right. We finally get it. We figure out it's negative 23, or, or with an easier example, we figure out it's 18, or whatever the case may be. Okay. It's more than a strong encouragement. It's you've got to stop guessing and checking if that's your game. If you're guessing and you're checking, it's got to stop. It should have stopped in algebra, but it's got to stop now. Uh, you cannot guess and check your way through all of math. There's it's just no way. Okay. Sometimes guessing and checking <laughs> is helpful to like introduce a new topic, but it can't be that way forever got to get on board with the idea that we have an equation here. We've got to balance it. We've got to do the same thing on both sides, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so don't get any checking. And don't just write the answer down without any work. It's not going to get you anywhere. All right. So we'll be done with that. Unless, are there any questions from the quiz? Any, any questions from the homework? Any questions? Other problem. Number 47, I got like 10 over 21 for some reason. The answer? Yeah. Oh, I wish I were that good, that I could just know exactly what happened. Uh, sometimes I have a guess, but I'm not sure exactly what happened. Maybe, um, you know, find a common denominator, you might have multiplied something wrong, or um, maybe mixed up a negative or something. But, uh, but I'll see it, I'll take a look at it, and see. What happened? All right. So, no other questions from some other part of the homework. Okay. Pass it in. Just a reminder: if you haven't stapled your work, just pass it in unstapled. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, briefly something called a relation, and then quickly we'll go past what a, a relation is into a specific kind of relation, which is called a function. Talk about what defines a function. Talk about how we can represent functions, graphs, and 
for repair and the table and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, then we will test and see if something is a function. Several different ways to do that. Uh, and then we'll get into slopes, rates of change today. All right. Um, so that is going to be in 2.1. So we've jumped over the last part of chapter 1. Now we're in chapter 2. So if we open up 2.1, that's where we are. Um, and again, this is, this is stuff I know that you've seen before, and maybe it's a little rusty. Maybe it was just touched on a little bit. Um, but particularly slopes, the slope of the line is going to be some review. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started with... Um, Relation is, is just a thing, okay? So you can think of this as a relation. Um, <coughs> and it's just this thing. It's just a thing, okay? Sometimes it'll be a rule. Sometimes it'll be uh, completely random. Sometimes it'll be an equation. Sometimes it'll be uh, just some data that relates to each other, okay? That's what they call it a relation, right? And a relation takes things from the domain, okay, so you can think of this as like you go to, you can look at a chart or a graph or anything like that, just go along maybe the horizontal axis or go along one, one uh, column of the table and look up the whatever, the eight, the seven, the nine, whatever that might represent, okay? And it relates it to something over here. So the, all of these guys over here, what we call the inputs, Okay, that's what goes into the relation. Uh, that big group of things is called the domain. Okay, so that's like our first definition of the domain, just a set of all the inputs. So all of these things are inputs, and that big collection of inputs is called the domain. And when something goes through the relation and comes out to the thing that it's related to, now it's n, well, that's an input, so this would be an output. And if we brought all those over here and collected them in one place, all this collection of outputs would be called the range. So we got the domain and the range. Okay. So we'll see if one of these things happens. So here's an input, it goes into the relation, it comes out, and now it's the output. So one got related to 1.2. Two gets related. 0.8, and we can do this for all 12 of them, related to 1.0. This is all a relation does, okay? Does it seem to be any rhyme or reason between these two things? Okay, does there? Is there some kind of, seem like some kind of rule? No? Probably could be, maybe? Um, So let me take the time to bring these all over. There's all the inputs and all the outputs. You're going to see them uh, right next to each other. Right. So all the inputs to the domain, all the outputs to the range. Any thoughts as to what, like, why one relates to 1.2? Like, what's relating the inputs to the outputs? Same question. Yeah. Why are the zeros XL? Oh, it's just the font I used. 
sometimes when people write their zeros, they put a line through it so that you know it's not an O. Oh. So, yeah, that line just, just make sure you know it's a zero. Any ideas? Any guesses at all? What, what the relationship could be? Just an equation. <laughs> could be an equation, but the thing is, it doesn't have to be an equation, and it doesn't even have to make sense. Okay? A relation can do anything it wants. It can relate whatever it wants to whatever else it wants. Okay? Now, the relations that we care about actually mean something. Okay? So this could be a completely random assignment of 1 to 1.2 and so on. Uh, but this one is actually 1 represents the month, and uh, well, the number represents the month, so 1 represents January, February. March and so on. And this is the average precipitation in that month in Missoula. Okay? So in January, we see about an average of 1.2 inches that month uh, of, of some kind of precipitation, whether it be rain or, or snow. Um, and in February, we see about 0.8 inches in that month and all the way down. Okay? So there's a relationship between the month, and I don't even have to use numbers for the month. I could use the words January, February, March, to relate a word to a number, or a number to a color, or whatever you want. That's relations, that's what they do. Okay. Now in mathematics, we, we do wind up usually using uh, numbers. So uh, we won't always be looking at uh, words to, to numbers or anything like that. We can represent this information several different ways. Um, this way, if, if we do something like this, <coughs> get an arrow, so let's get, right, you're in the way, okay. And we get this arrow right here, and we use black. So if I draw an arrow from the input to the output, input to the output, I'm just going to do this. Maybe I shouldn't have picked 12 things. I'm off. Wow. Okay. Well. Shouldn't have gotten off. Three, four, five. Big gap. One by one. So drawing it that way with those arrows, that's something called a mapping diagram. So there's one way to represent that function. Uh, another way is where I actually originally got this information. It's from a table. We could use ordered pairs, okay? So we could, instead of writing all of this down, we could use the ordered pairs. Um, we will copy this over to the next page. So we could use the ordered pairs, one comma 1.2, two comma 0.8. 3 comma 1.0 and so on and so on and so on. So, so far how many ways is that that we've represented a function? Three. Three. We got a mapping diagram, we got a table, we got ordered pairs. Any other ways you can think of to represent this relationship? Graph the pairs. You could graph the pairs, yeah. So, um, I actually have a graph. Can bring the table in so that we can refer to it. The this is the annual. So each month is somewhere between zero and two inches. And we can graph each of these. One to one point two, and February goes up to point eight. March goes up to one exactly. 
plot each of these points. You go to your input, okay, and that input gets mapped to the output, whatever that output is. So we have four different ways that we can represent a relation between a domain and a range. Just see if you're paying attention. This is, um, yeah. This should be, it's not quite showing up. This should be a negative here. So, this is three different ways, or four different ways, to represent a single relation. It's the same relation represented three different ways. So let's look at, you can look at this one, you can look at any of them and find this information, but what is the domain of this relation? What do we say the domain was? What's the definition of a domain? A set of inputs. A set of inputs, okay? So <laughs> it's always, it's input to output. Okay, if you look at it like that. So, it's just a collection of all the inputs that you see in that relation. So in this relation, what is the domain? Negative two, negative two, zero, three. Negative two, and we don't even have to write it twice. It could just be negative two is, is just one number, and then zero, three, that's the domain. You can see that in all these, negative two, zero, three, uh, negative two, zero, <coughs> and three. No other input has an output, so um, that's not part of the domain. And here, negative two, zero, three. And what is the range of this relation? Two, negative two, one. Two, negative two, and one. numbers and these squiggly brackets most often represent a set of things. All I want you to do is find the domain of the range and um, represent it um, using a graph and a mapping diagram. So in number six, how is it represented to start with? Ordered pairs. Ordered pairs. And then I want you to do a graph and a mapping diagram. Put everything short of
Um, okay, so first we'll find the domain. Here's some shorthand we could use, right? D for domain, R for range. The, do the domain would be a set of numbers. The squiggly bracket means a set is about to ensue. So what set makes up the domain? They are all the numbers. No need to necessarily put them in order from least to greatest. Uh, it's just a set of numbers. Okay. So what is the range consisting of? And what? Six. Inputs always in order pair. Yeah, order bears, inputs are always first and outputs are second. Okay. Um, so if I want to draw a mapping diagram, then how would I do that? Jessica? You would put um, the domains like, in the column and the range in the column and draw arrows to the one in the column. And that's it. You got the domain here, the range here. You could also say outputs and or, uh, inputs and outputs. That's what domain and range are. Uh, and we could write it however we want: two, negative three, one, negative seven, four, negative five, negative two, six. Uh, so, where do I draw an arrow from two? Two to negative five. And negative three, six, and one. Two, negative seven, and the seven goes to four, it's on its left. If I were to do a graph, then I would need some axes. What does this axis represent? Domain, yeah, where the domains would be found, or the x values, or the inputs. Okay, that's where the inputs are found, and what's found along this axis? The range with the the outputs. Okay, so that would look like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, comma four. There's a point right there. Two negative five. One negative two. And negative three, six. That's four, five, six. There we go. There, it's on the, it's on the graph now. Now this idea of I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you out. You, you, you may not know like what are the most significant things to get out of this. Okay? So I would say the most significant thing to get out of this is input. And output. Okay. If you had a strong grasp of input and output, and that there's this thing, okay, we'll talk more specifically about functions in a minute. There's this thing that takes an input and turns it into an output. And if I could talk to you and use the words input and output, and you had a strong grasp on what they mean, uh, what those words represent, um, and, and what they have to do with a function, I can answer a lot of questions uh, at least more quickly. Okay, so the words input and output, I would love to use those words uh, with you on a regular basis and for you to, to have no problem with them, okay? Um, then related to input and output, I would say that domain and range are terms that I'll use pretty often. Not as often as inputs and outputs, but domain and range are, are good. They pretty much sum up everything we've talked about. There's stuff that goes in, there's stuff that comes out, there's input and there's output. Um, in this relation, there's absolutely no reason uh, why two should go to negative five, or that negative seven should go to four, negative three should go to six. Uh, yeah, not that I can see. It's not ne necessarily a discernible like, equation that does that. Uh, it's just that relationship. Okay. Um, 
So let's talk about the domain that an equation might have. Okay, like, what would be the domain of this? Let's make it real simple. Let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's not do that. Let's do two times the number x. Well, maybe if, if, you, if you didn't know, the way this works, the way this uh, relation works, is you put things into x, right? You put anything you want in for x, and then you just see what happens, you know, what is the value of y, which y is just whatever you get after you do all the math on this thing. So um, you evaluate this expression for all the values that you could possibly ex evaluate it for uh, and see what comes out, okay? And then all of the things that you can put into the function together with all of the things you get out of the function uh, for, this, for this relation, that also would define the relation. Okay, so I ask, what is the domain of this relation? Yeah. What's that? Is it two? Is it two? Now, let's, I know it's, it's not an easy question. It's like, I'm not sure what to answer. It's, it's not two, though two is in the domain, okay? And the fact that two is in the domain has nothing to do with this two, okay? Here's what I want you to think about. Things go in there. What do we call things that go into a relation? Input. Input. And what comes out? Okay. Okay, so when I ask you what's the domain, I'm asking you what are all of the inputs, all the things that you could put into this relation. So what? What's that? Anything, is there anything you cannot put in there? Is there any limitations whatsoever? No. So, any input is okay, so the domain, Okay, now we need a, a way to say this. Not anything, right? So that's, that gets the idea across. Any what? Any what? Real number. Any real number, yeah. Uh, though we could put imaginary numbers in there. We don't really know what they are right now, as an algebra two class at the beginning of the year. And we just wouldn't do that anyway. We wouldn't put imaginary numbers in there. So all real numbers, any real number. Um, you can phrase it lots of different ways, okay? The most common would be all real numbers, right? Because the, the domain is the set of all of the inputs. And when you look at that set, what, what is it made of? All the real numbers. All the real numbers are in this domain. Because there's nothing you can't multiply by two, okay? Now, this is the same as writing this, an R with two vertical bars. Okay. Mathematicians love shorthand. They just make stuff up. Okay, All the real numbers. That's what that letter represents when it's written that way. How about the range? All the numbers. Is there anything you cannot get out of this function, out of this relation? No. Could you, if I asked you to give me a negative one out of there? What would you have to put in to get out of negative one? Negative one half. Negative one half, right? Two times a negative will give you negative. Two times one half is one, so there you go, there's a negative one. Uh, could you possibly get me negative 0.6739? Is it conceivable? Yes, somehow, yes, you could. So yes, again, all real numbers, that's the range <coughs> for this relation. So let's look at a relation that has some kind of a restriction either on the, the inputs that it can have or the outputs that it can have. Um, let's do this one. So the domain, what's the domain of this guy? Zero. 
zero to one. Zero to one. Um, so anything between zero and one works. From zero to one, we could represent that way for just a minute. Well, is, do you mean that you you can only put in numbers for x that are between zero and one? No, I mean like one over x has to be somewhere between those two numbers. Oh, okay. Well, you're talking about the output. You're talking about what happens after you divide. But we're talking about what can you put in for x. Right? Okay. Nice. Nice uh, reasoning, though. So when we get to the, the, the range, we'll talk about that. But we're just talking about what can you put in here. Okay. A nice question to ask yourself is, is there anything you can't put in there? And if there isn't anything you can't put in there, you just have all the real numbers again. Okay. So is there anything you cannot put in for x? Can we divide by a fraction? Yeah. What happens when you divide by fractions? Multiply by the reciprocal. So, no problem there. Decimals, can we divide by decimals? Yeah. Divide by negative numbers? Negative decimals? Yeah. Negative fractions? Really big numbers? Really small numbers? Is there anything we can't divide by? It's out there. It's in at least one of your brains. Is, is that the numbers that you're not going to teach us about the invisible or Nope, the nope. They are, they, there is a real number you cannot divide by. Is it zero? It's zero. Sorry, Chloe, if you had that already. Have you seen that? It, it's a really small meme online that's divide by zero. You get a picture of a really weird looking thing, and then you accuse the person of having divided by zero. Like, uh, I don't know. I'll find it. I'll show you some other time. So the domain. Is what then? How would we say this? That's 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 perfect. All real numbers, uh, and I would just use the word except zero. Is that an O or a zero? It's a zero. Okay. So any real number will do as long as it's not zero, because you can't divide by zero. <coughs> So there's a kind of a function that has restrictions on the domain. You can't divide by zero. Right? So any, any uh, relation that has a divide by in it, make sure that, that whatever you put in there, you're not caused to divide by zero, because that's a no-no. Is there any other kind of relation, that, you know, an equation? It, not necessarily zero, but there's like certain things you can't put in to that, kind of, you know, that mathematical operation. Can't divide by zero. Are there other things you can't do in math that you're aware of? Maybe not. There's lots of things you can't do, but there's some pretty typical ones that we work with in Algebra 2. We'll come upon them soon enough. Well, let's talk about the range then. Where it says between zero and one. Because the only numbers you can that, that one divided by a number can be is between zero and one. Okay. Would, you, would you accept a million dollars if I offered you the, the chance uh, to earn that million dollars just by telling me a way to get two by dividing by yeah? Um, point five. Divide by point five, divide by one half, you get two. There we're outside of zero to one. And let me ask you this, can you get zero? What number would you put in for x to get zero? Not zero, we know that, can't divide by zero. Negative one. One divided by negative one is zero. One divided by negative one, what's one divided by negative one? Negative one. Negative one. But he's back there, he's working. He's working the brain. Can you come up with it? Can you put in a number, divide one by some number and get zero? No. No, if you think about it, the only thing in the in a multiplication division, which is where we are, right? We're in multiplication division. The only thing in that realm that you can do to get zero is to multiply by zero. But we can't, we're not multiplying by zero. And we can't, you know, maybe you think uh, we could you know multiply by the reciprocal, right? So maybe we divide by one over zero. So we multiply the reciprocal, which is 0 over 1. That's not going to work, because you just put one, something in there that was being divided by 0, so that's no good either. Okay. 
Um, let's say you put in a, a million into x. What kind of a number would you get if you, if you put a one, a one million in there for x? Very small? Very small means very close to what? Zero. Close to zero. Can we get very, can we get closer than that to zero? Not Probably. by a billion. Huh? Not by a billion. Can we get closer than that? Can we get as close as we want to get? Yes? Zero is, you know, you give me a, a tolerance. Say, get within point zero, 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 one of, of zero. I'll get you there, right? I'll find a number big enough to divide by, and we'll get within that tolerance. But will you ever get to zero? Exactly, no. So it'll get close to zero, but it can't be zero. Okay, so we could just make a note of that, not zero. How about, um, you know, we can get fractions. We can clearly get things between zero and one. I right? figure than zero and up to one. Uh, we already were, were shown we could get two. Can we get three? What can we divide by to get three? Well, think in terms of fractions, and remember that when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So think, what would you have to multiply one by to get three? You have to multiply one by three to get three. So if you multiply one by three, that's the reciprocal of what? One third. One third, so you divide by one third. One third. Can you get four? Yeah. How? Exactly. Can you get five? Ten. A million. A billion. A trillion. Anything? Anything you want. Zero. You get 175.36. Conceivably, yes, you could. If you divide by 1 over 175.36, it would be weird, but uh, it is a number and you can divide by it. So, uh, big number, we're going to negative numbers. Can we get negative numbers? Divide yeah. by the negatives? The reciprocals of, of the negative numbers we're going to multiply by? Yeah, we can do all those. So, what's the range? There it is, the same as the domain. Actually, let's do not that one yet. Let's do this one. Why is that square? Square x. Well, I'm just going to push it out to you. You guys, in your notes, uh, decide what the domain is. And after you're sure you've got that, decide what the range is. And as you think about those, you just think, you just think, um, what kind of input's going to have and what kind of Output's going to have. I think it's just the right temperature. People are like, oh, it's hot, no, it's cold. Yeah. Heaters were on this morning, it's still like burning hair. Like a hair? Are you done? Don't look at your work. I just did my hair. Write it down?
extra ball. Extra ball? Extra. It's a double helping. Let's see. So the domain for this guy. We're asking ourselves, so it kind of takes some practice doing a few of these, uh, what kind of numbers can you put into this relation? And, and to ask that is to ask, what kind of numbers can you square? Gordon? All of them. All of them. Right? Huh? It's good to think, uh, it, it's helpful to think, all right, what, what are all the numbers? Like big numbers. Can I square a big number? Of course. Can I square a small number? Can I square one? Can I square a fraction? Can I square a decimal? Can I square zero? That's a good one. Can I square zero? No. Yeah, okay. Can I square negative numbers? No. Uh, okay, well, I'm stumped to try and figure out a number I cannot multiply by itself. I certainly can multiply a number by itself. So, yeah, all real numbers. Okay. And uh, Reese, what do you got for the range? Um, all positive real numbers. All positive real numbers. And one more number. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I like it. So um, here's a way to say all positive real numbers. Uh, and zero. Why do we have to say and zero? It's not positive. It's not positive. It's also not negative. It just is zero. <laughs> can you just put greater than or equal to zero? You can also do that. You can say, um, so the range is the set of all what? Uh, not specifically for this problem, but in general, like the definition of the range. The outputs. The outputs. Okay. What letter represents the outputs here? Y. Y. So, uh, you can just say y greater than or equal to zero. That also would convey the mechanism. You can write it out all in words. All the real numbers will be just fine, and so will zero be okay as well. Right? You can write it out like that. Just convey exactly what numbers work. into this relation, and based on what this relation is, you're just really asking, what numbers can I take the square root of? Because that's all you're going to do with this step, is take the square root of it. What numbers can you take the square root of, and what numbers maybe can you not take the square root of?
serious? It's totally serious. It's just part of how you feel. It's no, it's not. You're very, you're, you're very good at keeping a straight face. Mm -hmm. Maybe your beard hides it. Yeah. Everything goes on behind this. So. <laughs> like your mask. Okay. Um, any strong feelings about the domain? What number is going to be the square root of? Not all at once. I can't understand you when you talk over each other. See? Straight face. I am practicing it. Come on, I saw some good answers out there. Counter to that, like, no, you can't take the square root of this number. Or can't take the square root of negatives, right? Square root of negative number? Does that ring a bell? Remember that? We'll talk about it more in depth in a second, yeah? All positive real numbers? So, all positive real numbers? Yeah. Any other ones? Yeah. And zero. Okay. So, uh, following Gordon's Suggestion will say x needs to be greater than or equal to zero. That's cool. All real numbers and zero, or all positive real numbers and zero, that's cool too. Okay. So to help you remember why you can't take the square root of a negative number, what's the square root of four? Two. It's two. Why? Because two times two is four. Because two times exactly itself is four. So what would the square root of negative four be? Do it. There's nothing that can multiply by its exact copy to get a negative number. Right? It's positive. Two positives multiply to make a positive. It's a negative. Two negatives multiply to make a negative. The only or no positive. The only way to get a negative is a positive times a negative. Those aren't identical numbers. There you go. There's a reminder of that it's it's directly linked to why the output of this always comes out to be positive, or in one special case, it comes out to be zero. Exactly, like it's not similar to or kind of close to. It's exactly the same reason why that happens. When we square a number, we multiply it by itself, which will always come out to be positive. Okay, that's not an eraser. That's an eraser. So what's the range? Same. The same. Okay. Okay. So is y always greater than or equal? Well, if we were to be really well, less, less than that. x, what's that? Less than x. Why has to be less than x? Yeah. Um, why? Uh, unless it's always going to be less than x if it's a fraction. Yeah. Right. So we'll just most well in the, in the statement of the domain and the range, we won't say that y has to be something related to x. In the range, y just needs to be what y is going to be. And the domain x just needs to be what x is going to be. Um, so let's go back to the square root of 4. Tell me a number you can multiply by itself to get 4. 2. 2. Tell me another number you can multiply by exactly itself to get 4. Negative 2. So really, when we take the square root of a number, well, there isn't a the square root. There isn't the number that you can multiply by itself to get four. There's two numbers, positive and negative. So keeping that in mind, what's the output? What is the range of this function? All positive Well, if I take the square root of, say, four, right, put four in there, what do I get out? You get two things out of here, plus and minus two. So any, any real number. Any real number. Because I can get zero as well. All real numbers, positives, negatives, zeros, you can get them all. Okay. Well, that'll do it for our domain range talk. This guy right here is different from all the ones we've looked at so far, okay? Because 
No other function has done this. So no other relation has done this. No other relation has put out two things when you put in one thing. Uh, and, and all of th it goes for all of these, uh, except for this one. You see, this one also, you input negative 2, you get out negative 2 and positive 2 for that relation. Um, but for these ones, you put in 2, you get out negative 5. You put in negative 3, you get out 6. There is no case where you put in one thing and get out two things. We can look at these equations. 2x, multiply 2 times x, you only get one answer. Uh, divide 1 by x, you only get one answer. Divide, or multiply x by itself, you only get one answer. But in this case, you get 2. Okay. So if that happens, then it's just a relation. But if that doesn't happen, and there is no case where an input gives you more than one output, that's called a function. Okay. Let's go over here and write function down. Function. So what's, what's a relation? How would you define a relation so far? What does a relation do? Input turns into an output. Input turns into an output. It can't get any more simple or more complicated than that. That's, that's it. it. Input becomes output. It takes things from the domain and maps them to things in the range. Okay. So it's a, a function is a relation. We have a notion of what a relation is. It takes an input and gives an output. Okay, a relation where uh, each input has. Okay, I want you to finish this sentence. Okay, and remember what we want to have happen is when we put in an input, how many outputs do we get out? One. One. Okay. So, how do we finish this? Each input has. One output does, think about this hard, does four, when I put it in here, does it have one output? No. Yes, it has one. It also has two, two right? It does have one. I can count one, one of them, and one I can also more. count the second one. So what? One or more. Ugh. We don't. We only want one, right? We don't want any more than one for a function. Exactly one? Exactly one. It has exactly one. Output. Functions, when you put something into a function, okay, this is a very, you know, a subset of relations. When you put something into a function, you get only one thing out. Not two, not three, not any other number, not even zero. You can't get zero things, right? If you put something that's in the domain into a function, you have to get something out. Okay? So exactly, exactly one. One and only one. So let's look at uh, the exercise part of the homework and look and see, uh, say, numbers 10 through 13. Can you find an example in 10 through 13, so these are mapping diagrams, can you find an example where there's, it's not a function? 12. 12, why? Um, okay, that's, that's one way you could look at it. But more specifically, give me a specific example that disqualifies this from being a function. Yeah. Negative one has two outputs. Negative one has two outputs. You're done. Negative one has an output of two, and negative one, that can't happen in a function. It can only have one output. Any others? Huh? 13. 13. Is 13 a function? Yes. Okay. How does it, is it everybody or, or, or several people every year say the same thing? They say 13 as well. Okay. But what we're looking for is one input, one output. In, so it doesn't say anything about the other way around. It doesn't say outputs can't have more than one input. Right? Every input. So does every input have one output? Yeah, negative 8 only has 1, negative 4 only has 1, 0 only has 1, 4 only has 1 output. Okay. Uh, 
Um, Sounds for that. So there is number five, and we want to graph this. It's a, it's a relation at least. I mean, it has a place to put things in x and a place to get things out y. Uh, and if we want to graph all of the solutions, which means all inputs that pair with outputs to make the equation true, it's what. Vertical line. Uh -huh. A vertical line? It's not going to be a vertical line. But it is going to be a line. And that's important. We're going to want to be able to identify specific functions called linear functions, that be functions that, whose graphs are lines. Okay. And if we don't remember how to graph lines, it's all right. We'll graph them at another time, like with slope and y-intercepts and that kind of stuff. But at the very least, any function that you want to graph, well, need some points and then you need to connect those points okay so if we didn't have any idea what this graph would look like how would we get some points that's good sure okay. why not like a mapping diagram okay what are we going to put here you could start with one start with one why not? whatever you want start with one you do something else Two, three, zero, negative, five, negative, whatever you want to put in there, right? Give yourself an idea of what this is gonna look like. Three three points is good, four points is good, if you have no idea what the graph looks like. Okay? So one is gonna map in this mapping diagram, what's it gonna to map to? Three. Two will map to four. Five three will map to five. Okay, so we have these, we can also write these down where more used to seeing points represented as ordered pairs. We could write them that way. We could create, I think the most common way to do what we're doing is to make a table, right? Uh, whatever, as long as we have some input output pairs, uh, we can graph this thing. So one comma three, and two comma four, and three comma five. You see this steady stepping up pattern? Okay. What do we call that stepping up? That slope? Yes. Right, we get that slope. Slope will be more specifically covered in the next section, but yes, it has a slope. Lines have slope. Man, it don't look something like that. Well, if we know it's a line, then how many points do we absolutely need to graph to draw a line? Two. Two. That's the bare minimum of the number of points that you have to graph. Uh, so we need to find two points. So we could do that. We could just find two points. Later we'll figure like a pattern that we can follow where we don't even have to find points, really, uh, at least that way. Um, so that's nice. If you know what you're about to graph as a line, you only have to find two points, and you draw a straight line between them. So now the question is, how do we know that what we're about to graph is going to be a line? Anybody know? It's going to sound so familiar, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, let's generalize this. So a linear function, that's one where if you graph it, it's going to be a line. If you can write it like this, y equals mx plus b. If you can write it that way, it's definitely a linear function. That doesn't mean that you can't write linear functions other ways. Maybe it won't look that way when you first see it. But if you can get it to look like that, a constant times x plus another constant, is a line when you graph it. <coughs> okay. The last thing that I want to show you is a thing called function notation. You guys get into function notation before? Okay. I can write an equation like this. Y equals x plus 2. That's a function. Okay. That's a function we just looked at. Here is the way to write it with function notation. It's exactly the same thing. Okay? This side of it acts the exact same way as the right side of this one. So the right sides are exactly the same. Also, the left sides 
act, exactly function, exactly the same way as the left side here. This y is the exact same thing as f of x. Okay, so here's why we do this. Here's here's one reason. Okay, uh, if we have y equals x plus two, uh, and I like wanted to give you some instructions on plugging values in. Okay, I would have to say uh, put three into that function and see what comes out. So you'd have to say like when x equals three, then y equals what? Five. Okay, you gotta like write some similar statement like this. You have to say x is this and then y is this. Right? And so if you were to do this a bunch of times, you have to say when x equals four, then y equals Six. Okay, this, this takes long, a long time. Which is like shortcuts and uh, and shorthand. So rather than that, rather than say when x equals three, y equals five, we say f of three. The function has a name. The name is f. And then right here, you just put what is the input. Well, in general, the input's x. Specifically, right now, we're going to put an input of three. So. What's f of 3? It's 5. f of 3 is 5. When I put 3 into that function f, then I get 5. OK, let me write another function, g of x. Okay. x will still represent the input, but now the name of the function is g. Now we don't have a bunch of functions that are y equals y equals y equals y equals and don't have different names. Okay. So g of x equals 3x minus 1. So now what's g of 3? It's 8. g of 3 just means you're going to put 3. Where? Over here? Why not? Why don't you put it over here? Because that one's f. We want g. Okay, I make that specific by writing g. Put it in there. 3 times 3 is 9 minus 1 is 8. Okay. So the advantage we have with function notation is names. We can give functions names now, f, g, h, r, q, p, whatever we want. Okay? And then we put parentheses there. These parentheses have nothing to do with multiplication. You're not multiplying g by 3 or f by x. It's just a notation that says this function's name is f. When you look on the other side of the equation, the input is going to be represented by x. Okay? And if I put a number here, I want you to replace the x on the other side with that number. Okay. So what's g of 4? 11. 11. What's f of 6? 8. Eight. That's all function notation is. It might still cause you some confusion. That's just fine. But the only thing it is is names of functions and a way to represent that I want you to put this number into the function rather than having to say when x is something y is this. you're trying to figure out if it's, if it's a function, how do we know that it is not a function? Annette? So again, no, our words make sense, right? So if one input has more than one output. Two or more output. OK, so uh, in ordered pairs, that would look like Hey, we got a 2 comma 3 and a 2 comma 5, right? That input 2 has two outputs. If we're looking at a mapping diagram, well, one number will have two arrows coming off of it going to two different numbers. Uh, in a table, that input will appear twice. On a graph, what will that look like? I'll go to this, say, this input. OK? So how? Let's say that I go to this input and then I, by looking at it, I realize, oh, this isn't a function. What will it look like on that graph that tells me it's not a function? Yes, you have two points directly above each other. 
about the other. Okay. What could you draw through those two points? What kind of a line? Just straight up and down, which is what we call vertical. Okay. So I was able to draw a vertical lines through that and touch how many points? Two or more. Okay. So if there's any place where you can draw a vertical line and touch the graph more than once, is it a function? No. No, that's called a vertical line test. Have a good day.